Well, welcome to Easter service, Resurrection Sunday at Fellowship Bible Church. We're delighted that you've joined us. The service is going to be done a little differently this morning. We will engage in a couple of different times of teaching. We'll intersperse that with some worship. Um, we'll hear from someone who definitely believes in the resurrection and why that's important to her. So it's going to be a special morning all the way around. Let me just start by telling you um, that there's a couple of ideas you have to understand regarding the Easter service, first of all. You can't get to a resurrection without a death. And so part of what the cross was to do was to certify that indeed Jesus was dead. But you can't get to forgiveness in the Bible without the death of an innocent man. Actually, the Romans accomplished both of this, these elements for us, both with the cross, which the Romans would crucify Christ on, as well as with Pilate, the governor, who would declare Christ to be innocent. In fact, here's how it worked. Before we get to Resurrection Sunday, just let me back up and take you back to the cross in Good Friday for a second. Prior to his death on a cross, the Jews in Israel could not have the power to execute someone, but they wanted Jesus out of the way desperately. And so they leaned into the Roman government, which was ruling their country at the time. They leaned into that government to bring the pronouncement of death or crucifixion to Jesus. In order for that to happen, they had to go through Pilate. Pilate was the governor of the area of Israel. He was a long way from Rome that ran everything, but he was clearly under the accountability of Rome. And so when the religious leaders brought Jesus to Pilate, they asked for his death. They asked for him to be crucified. And they threatened, as it were, a riot if he didn't follow through on that. What makes Pilate's story interesting is no less than nine times in the gospel record, Pilate says, this is an innocent man. This is a man who has done no wrong. This is a man who has not done anything worthy of death. Nine times, Pilate repeats that. Can you imagine? Here is the governor who is about to hand him over to be crucified, and all he does is say, he is innocent, 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 innocent. That's so important because of this text. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. For there we read, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. And then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus was indeed innocent. So when he, as an innocent, holy man, was executed, his very death could pay the penalty for the rest of us who had death coming because we were sinners. But remember, I mentioned that the cross wasn't only about, or Pilate was about declaring him innocent. The cross was about certifying his death. The Romans had developed, they weren't the first ones to come up with crucifixion. The Persians had beat them to it several hundred years earlier, but the Romans mastered it in its pain. The cross and crucifixion was to, was to be three things. It was to be public, it was to be painful, and it was to be certifiable. Public. If you had someone who was rebelling against your nation and your authority and you were hundreds of miles away, you probably wanted to let everybody see them die publicly. Hence. These crosses were placed alongside the road for people to see as they traveled. Someone would be on the cross dying painfully. That also would serve as a pretty strong discipline to not do whatever that person was doing on the cross. Can you imagine being a parent, walking with a child? You'd see the person squir squirming on the cross, dying, and you would say, listen, whatever he did, you don't want to grow up to do what he did, okay? So it was public. It was painful. It was painful because on the cross, you died by suffocation. The movement of your arms, which would have been nailed into the cross beam, and your feet that would be nailed, would mean that your body would want to sag because to pull up, it would, cr it would pr pressure on the menial arms, nerves in the arm and the nerves that ran through your legs. And so you would only push up under great pain, but you had to push up. <clears throat> Because while you could get oxygen in, you couldn't exhale properly. And so in that slumping position, the carbon dioxide would build up in your lungs. 
you could still breathe in, but eventually you'd feel like you weren't getting oxygen and you'd take shorter and shorter and shorter breaths. So you'd heave up to exhale and then you'd collapse and start the process over and over and over again. At some stage in the process, the pain and trauma would become so intense that the serum would start to build around the pericardium of your heart and eventually your heart would give out under such pain and such suffering. This is what the Bible says Christ went through for you and for me. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our sin fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. But remember I said you needed to certify the death. In fact, if you had a rebellious slave and you crucified him, the last thing you'd want him to do is to come back to life again because then the rebellion would start all over again. And so the centurions who were at the base of the cross were responsible for pronouncing the, death, um, the, the act of death upon the one who was on the cross. This is really important. So important was it to Rome that if you were a centurion and you got this wrong, you would be crucified as well as your entire cohort of 100 soldiers. Okay. There's a ton of pressure to get this right. So when Jesus comes off the cross, he is fully, completely, physically dead as he goes into the tomb. Here's what you want to understand about the cross. Jesus died here, satisfying the wrath of God for the sins of those who were not innocent, like you and like me. But he didn't stay on the cross. In fact, by 3 o'clock, they took him down. And Joseph of Arimathea placed him in a tomb, a tomb that they would come to the next morning. And that tomb is important for another reason, because of how they discovered him, how they discovered the condition of the tomb when they came there. Now, this is Easter morning. We rejoice in it. We're excited. We all say he's risen. But just for a moment, just for a moment, Go back and imagine what it must have been like for these people to come to the tomb expecting to find the body there so that they could repack it with spices and therefore do the embalming process on Sunday morning. I don't know about you, but as a pastor, I spend some time at cemeteries. I've been there when I've watched parents leave a child, an adult child, I've watched them not want to leave. I've even been there on occasion when someone has gone back to visit a tomb, a cemetery. They're remembering the person, but they're not expecting them to be alive again. Imagine what happens when they come to the tomb. Here's the text. Take a look at John chapter 20. Here is what we read. Early in the morning... While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one whom Jesus loved, and she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Now follow along with me on the screen. Watch this. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple, that would be John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked inside at the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter arrived and when he went, arrived and went inside, and he noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up, the lying part from the other and lying apart from the other wrappings. And then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, that is John, and he saw and he believed. Wow. Twice in this text, it says that the linen wrappings were lying there. Now, think about this for a moment. Earlier in the Gospel of John, in verse 38, we're reminded that when, um, that when Joseph of Arimathea brought Jesus' body to the tomb, he packed it literally with 75 pounds of spices. Just imagine. They would take dry spices. They would mix them in with ointment or oil. They would pack those in, and they would fill, as it were, the linen wrappings. Now, just for a moment, imagine this. The way that it is described is the linen wrappings lying there. Um, 
is placed there twice, but it is also placed in, in the original language in the emphatic position, which means it's there for emphasis. It's trying to communicate something that John saw. Here is what John saw. He would have seen the linen wrappings, but he would have seen them differently. He wouldn't have seen them discarded, as it, wa as it were, by, by, um, by thieves who would have come to take the body or steal the spices. He would have seen those linen wrappings lying, and just for a moment, imagine this. He would have seen them lying perfectly as if the body had not taken them off, but had almost passed through the linen wrappings. This is a different kind of tomb experience than you might ever expect. Like you would look in and you would see where the body should have been, and because there were 75 pounds of ointment and spices, there would still be some lifting of those linens, but they would have fallen, almost like a balloon that has lost its air is laying there undisturbed. John looked, Peter looked and marveled, but John looked and believed. Okay. But there's another note in this text that's so important. It is the fact, and it had to do with uh, what we call the face cloth or um, the, the portion that would have gone over the head of the deceased. That would have been separate from these. They would have wrapped the body with the spices, an additional 75 pounds. They'd have wrapped all of that in the linen wrappings, and then they'd have placed, as it were, this face cloth over the head of the individual, and then they'd have tied that, sometimes tying it down around the jaw, and so there would have been an opening, as it were, here between the linen wrappings and the face cloth. Okay? Now, our text says that the face cloth was folded up neatly and placed there as if something a thief would have never done had actually occurred. There's another way that that translation can be rendered, not simply that it can be folded, but that it could have been, as it were, this face cloth, that it could have been twirled or wrapped. In other words, that's how it would have been. It would have been twirled around the head of Christ as if the ointments and, and, and spices had actually elevated this face cloth. Picture this as if when John looks at it, he sees something that looks like this, separate from this part, but still maybe still holding the appearance or the wrapping, as it were, of where the head of Christ had been. This, this is alarming. This is something like you would never expect to see in a tomb. And yet there it was for Peter to marvel at and for John to see and believe. Now, this is so important. Just listen to this part. Just think about this for a second. John had not yet seen the risen Christ, but he believed. John had only seen the evidence of the risen Christ, and he believed. Perhaps you're one today who says, yeah, Phil, I hear you. I would believe, I'd believe if I saw him. I would just tell you that that's not the faith that John had. John saw evidence and believed. You say, well, Phil, give me evidence. Okay, I will. Here it is. Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15 says, For I delivered unto you that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins on the cross according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That little phrase, for I delivered unto you what I also received, was a statement. It was almost like a, a, a code. It was something that the early church said because it's written so close to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We would say that it's not really a legend, which takes years to develop, but it is actual, like a, like a statement, like a commitment they would make, remembering. That's so important. What we believe about the risen Christ isn't something that had the time to become legend. 200 years ago, it takes 200 years largely for something to become legend. Why? Because generation after generation after generation has to die off. That's not the case in the statement Paul makes. They're within probably 20 years, 15 to 20 years of the people seeing the resurrected Christ. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15 goes on to say. For Paul says, listen, he was seen first of all by Peter, then by the 12, by 500 eyewitnesses, by James, the brother of John, and lastly, by me. Okay. Just think about those witnesses for a second. Peter saw the risen Christ, and yet 
he had been intimidated by a servant girl just hours earlier. The 500 eyewitnesses saw the risen Christ. That's like a portion of our congregation here this morning. That's like all of us would be eyewitnesses to an account. The, the disciples who had been deeply fearful saw the risen Christ, and yet many of them would die martyrs' deaths unwilling to acknowledge that they had not seen what they had seen. James was the brother of Jesus. He was cynical in the early parts of the New Testament, but he isn't now, and Paul was one who was fully opposed. These are the witnesses, someone who was intimidated, someone who was fearful, 500 as masses, a cynical person and an opposed person, and yet they stand up and say, I know I used to be that, but this is what I am now. Picture this. If you took those numbers of witnesses and gave them only 15 minutes of eyewitness testimony, they would go into, imagine momentarily, the Woodbury County Courthouse, and for five solid days, and you only gave them 15 minutes each, there would be five solid days of 24-hour testimony from all the people who had seen the risen Christ. I would just submit to you that it seems reasonable that if you have that many eyewitnesses that close to the occurrence of one who we knew was crucified and certifiably dead, that you would have to say, this person is no longer dead, but they are alive. You say, well, that doesn't make sense naturally. That's because God is a supernatural God with a supernatural book. But it doesn't change the fact that it's absolutely true. What happened and what the disciples saw in the tomb caused one to marvel and caused one to not just marvel, but to believe. I would submit to you today that wherever you are in your relationship or a lack of relationship with God, that you don't need to see God to believe. You need nearly see the evidence of his work to believe. A number of years ago, I was sharing in our sunrise service this morning, a, a number of years ago, um, I was... Uh, <coughs> in a service, a sunrise service that we had over here at a local lake. And we had it there in that particular community because we didn't have a church building and we didn't have any place to go, so we asked if we could use their facility. There was a man in our church who had been coming um, for, uh, for probably about a year. He was 80 years old when he became a Christian. He had not lived his life like a Christian. He would battled through a war. He knew the pain, the emotional struggle, the, the, the nightmares of that war. He lost his leg in that war. He was an older man. He was bitter. He was cantankerous. In fact, he was known in the community as one who was intoxicated more than he wasn't. But on one Sunday morning, I watched, we were meeting in a public high school, while his son led him to Christ. Sitting there, I walked by, saw them sitting in the chairs. He was there in church. I remembered praying for them as I was walking past. And later, the, father, the son called me and said, you're never going to believe this, something I thought would never happen. My dad surrendered his life to Christ this morning. What makes that story so amazing is that when we met at this local lake, the owner of that lake came up to me, saw the man in the wheelchair, greeted him, and came back to me and said to me, what happened to him? What, what happened to him? Because I'm a believer, and this man's been coming to, to me for years, purchasing eggs and stuff, and I know him not to be a church-going man, okay? And I had the privilege of saying, listen, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, the new has come. Perhaps today, if you're saying, Phil, I just don't see enough evidence, maybe you need to look at the people around you who have proclaimed Christ, how God changed their life from where they were to who they are now. I will tell you again, between the scriptures and the genuine life of Christ in people who are genuine believers, there is the ability to see not perfect people, but people who know what it's like to be forgiven by a God who sent his son to die on a cross, whose son was buried in a tomb, but whose son didn't stay in the tomb. That's the promise of the resurrection. Well, this is Mary Torino. I think you're on there, Mary. And I promised you uh, that you get a chance to hear from someone who has been ministered to by the resurrection. So up until now, 
we've been talking with you about maybe you believing, like um, seeing what Christ had done for you on the cross and then taking a look at the evidence that was laid out in the tomb and thinking, okay, this is indeed believable, but what does the resurrection do to someone who's experienced the loss of someone they've loved and how does that help us? So, Mary, um, we're talking to you today because you're one of those who believes with great hope in the resurrection. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and so uh, a number of years ago, you lost your husband, but for those who may not know, um, Victor succumbed to uh, abastosis. But be, for those who may not know, um, tell us about um, how many years you were married and how you met, right? Can you do that for us? In like 60 seconds or less. Okay, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm gonna hold Victor this up and I there met at a, a dance and... Uh, I was 16 and he was 17. I was the coat girl and he came in with several other friends and when I came back from the coat room, I had lost his coat check. And so- Intentionally um, or? No. Oh, okay, okay, it, just checking. It was in the plan, God had a plan. <laughs> and so uh, after I finished my uh, duties in the coat room, uh, Victor came to me and he said, um, you lost my coat, so you owe me a dance. Wow, that's how it happened, huh? Yes. And that started a romance and a love affair that lasted for 50 years. 50 years you were married. And we never stopped dancing. Yeah, that's great. Great story. Well, one of the things that makes your story unique is that when you first got married, you became a Christian, but Victor took a little longer, right? Yes, quite and a bit. Uh, quite a bit longer. Quite a bit so, longer. Okay, <laughs> so you prayed for him. So tell yes. us about how, because this is how I was introduced to Mary before. Mary now lives on the other side of the river, so she attends church over there. But before you guys started coming here, I was introduced to you by the woman who had prayed for her husband to become a Christian longer than anybody I'd ever met before, okay? <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what your habit of life was to pray <coughs> for Victor's salvation mm -hmm. and his surrender to Christ. And, and, um, and then tell us um, how long you did that for. Well, I was 32 years old when I accepted Christ, and I thought right away, Victor might see a change in me, a light, something. Um, however, he just uh, thought it was a whim, and he really wasn't interested in my new savior. So I uh, decided that I would attempt to become a biblical wife because I was so new in the Lord, and I learned deeply from his word that I could love Victor, but only the Holy Spirit could save him. And that's how that went for 48 years. Um, prayer, love, and the Holy Spirit ministered to me so that I could minister and love him. I remember, Mary, at uh, Victor's funeral, I remember talking to some of your kids who would say to me, you need to understand, we, we would get up in the morning and our mom would be sitting like in a rocking chair there with her Bible open praying for my dad. I mean, their mm -hmm. recollection was you praying for their father mm -hmm. um, to come to know the Lord for a very, very long time. And at that was a privilege. It's great to hear. That was a privilege. It's great to hear. Um, yeah. One of, the things, um, one of the things that was challenging is all of a sudden one day Victor, through some physical suffering and pain and difficulty was going through and some uncertainty, reached out and trusted Christ. I mean, that's yes. a phenomenal story. That, that's probably for another time. But that's for another time, but the words that he said was this. I heard him from another room in our house. I heard him shout, Mary, I believe. Wow. Okay. I know that story from six years ago, and still that kind of grabs For my another heart. Day, another time. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it was a great element where the prayers of a praying wife had moved the heart of God in such a way that God moved the heart of the man, mm -hmm. which was beautiful. Mary, within, um, how long after um, Victor said he believed was he diagnosed with abastosis, and then about how long um, did he live after, after that? After two years. So you had two years with him as a believing husband. Yes, I did. 
okay? And then um, tell us again about what the doctor told you. Um, you shared that with me. When the doctor said, this is about how long you have, I can give you this, this, and this. The doctor guaranteed us six months, and he said that I would be able to give you Christmas, Valentine's Day, I will be able to give you St. Patrick's Day, but I cannot promise Easter. And sure enough, Victor went home with the Lord right before Easter that year. Wow. There's a passage that I want to um, have the congregation see. It's going to be on the screen behind us here um, because it talks about not, not Mary, but Martha when Jesus came to uh, her. So let, let me just see if you can pull that up. Here it is. Um, Jesus told her, that is Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? If I could change that today and say, Mary, do you believe this? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, and, it, and for six years of loss without your husband, it has been an enabling factor for you to go through life. Talk us through that a little bit. How has the resurrection made, I, I know being a widow is difficult, how has the resurrection made it, made it less so or more comforting? Well, I could honestly say today to all of you that when Victor went home, um, it was a precious, precious time. I saw that uh, he already had had one foot in heaven, and he was peaceful. He was uh, trusting, and that his faith was so strong that he wasn't afraid, he wasn't bitter, he wasn't angry, but he was willing. And he was willing because he knew the strength and the purpose of that cross. Mm -hmm. I did not think myself that I could survive one day without that man, without that hug, without that dance. But the Savior embraced me. He kept his promise to a widow. And he loves me and you with an everlasting love. And I can say this. It is good. And I am blessed. Mm, that's great. Um, those who have more recently been coming may not remember that for the longest time you guys had the f couple pews down front yes, here. Yes, so I'm sitting in I that knew when pew you were today. There. <coughs> and there was a while, actually. <laughs> you're right back in your place, huh? Yes, That's I am. great, great. Um, Someone's missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is someone else missing too because um, for over the last year, your sister would join you here, yes. Joanne. Mm -hmm. And she lived right over here off Route 45 in Mantua. Yep. Um, and this had become her fellowship, and she was sitting here. Um, she moved home to be with her children in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and you recently were by her bedside yes. when she went home to be with the yes. Lord. Can you take a moment, like just within the last several weeks? Yes. Right, yeah. Yes. So take a moment down in North Carolina. So take a moment and tell us um, about that passing, because I want people to hear again that it isn't only the loss of a husband. Sometimes it's even the loss of a sister, mm -hmm. where the resurrection has ministers to them and ministers to you. Tell us about that passing. Yes. Well, uh, my sister Joanne was a little tiny person. I call her that she was a tiny package. But inside that box was a lot of rejection and hurt, sadness. However, when she accepted Christ, in that box went the love of Jesus. And there was a joy that many of us could see on her face. I had the privilege to be with her for the last 10 days of her life. I saw her take her very last breath. And I had the privilege to say to her, Joe, you're home. Mm -hmm. What a moment to see my sister following my husband's footsteps, but I had peace because I knew where they were going, and they had eternity, and I just said, wait for me, I'm coming, <laughs> but uh, God said, not yet. Mm -hmm. My name is in that book as long as he says, mm -hmm. and I am embraced 
in his love. That's great. I think sometimes we forget when we come to Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Mary, thank you so much for sharing. And we forget how that resurrection, the fact that we serve a risen Savior, gives incredible hope oh, yes. to us when we come close to dying on death's mm -hmm. doorstep mm -hmm. or when we're left here behind those who we have loved so much. Go ahead. Yes, and certainly I have been touched, and I know where I'm going, mm -hmm. and I trust that everyone in this sanctuary today can know mm -hmm. because because of the resurrection, we are free. And his blood paid that price for me and for you. No greater gift. That's great. Mary, thank you so much for your 48 years of prayers, for just seeing God work and the miracle story that Victor's life was, and uh, for sharing your testimony of the importance of the resurrection. You're loved here. We missed you when you moved over the other side, but we are glad to have you back, at least for Easter. God bless you, Mary. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, we have one more element to talk about, and that is the stone that was in front of the tomb. That's a, a remarkable story because the gospel, again, gives us these unique details about this particular event, and it's helpful to know. The stone was probably round or circular in nature. In biblical times, the body would be placed into, especially in Israel, where there wasn't soft dirt around, but there was a lot of rock. They would hew a tomb out of the rock, and then you would place the body in the tomb. The thing is, is that it would only be for one family, and so they had what they would call, I'm not making this up, true story, a bone box at the base of that shelf. And therefore, after the body had decayed over maybe a significant period of time, the bones would go into the box with the bones of everybody else who was a part of that family. So if you didn't get along with your family, you had a problem because your bones were gonna be with theirs for a very long time, okay? You might wanna fix your problems this side of death. And so that's the image that was there. What we know from the gospel record is that this tomb with the large stone in front of it was, was a tomb in which no body had ever been laid. Joseph of Arimathea said, hey, listen, I have a tomb. Can I take the body off the cross? This is highly unusual. Normally, an individual who's crucified on a cross, their body would simply be thrown over in the landfill because they were criminals. The dogs would pick at it. Everything else would pick at it. But there would no, be no dignity. But Joseph of Arimathea takes the body off the cross with Nicodemus. They pack it. They place it in the tomb. And then this stone would have like a ledge, and it would, they'd kick the wedge out, and it would roll down and lock in place, okay? Now, this is only a replica, but the real stone would have weighed somewhere between uh, 2,000 to 4,000 pounds, one to two tons. Once this is in place, you're not going to move it, which is why the women, when they come to the tomb that morning, say, hey, who's going to help us roll the stone away? But they find that the stone is rolled away. In fact, the gospel record uses four different words to describe the condition of the stone. In Matthew 27, verse 60, we read that the stone was rolled against the doorway. That's the Greek word kaleo. It actually means that the stone was rolled in place and sealed. In Mark chapter 16, verse 3, when it refers to the stone being rolled away, it says the stone was ana kaleo, Greek word there, ana, meaning up, Leo uh, against up an incline away from the opening as if someone had taken the 4,000 pound stone and moved it back up the incline. But Luke uses an entirely different word. He uses the Greek word apa, which means that the stone was a great distance away from the tomb, okay? That it just wasn't up the incline, but that it was up and away from the tomb. I love that. But perhaps no one captures it quite as detail, as much detail as John does. But the Gospel of John records that the stone was arrow. Literally, uh, the Greek word there means to pick something up and carry it away. It just wasn't rolled up. It just wasn't rolled up a distance away. But it was rolled up a distance away in which it would appear that someone had picked it up and carried it. Wow. You say, who carried the stone away? Like it weighs 4,000 pounds, thieves aren't going to grab it. Thieves aren't going to leave the linen claws untampered with. The stone is moved away 
only to reveal that the tomb is empty, that Jesus isn't there, so that everyone would know that on Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. In fact, probably the best place to look in regards to this is to Romans chapter 8. In fact, I'll just read there briefly. <clears throat> it's an incredible passage for it says in verse, in, in verse um, 10, <clears throat> and Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Here it is, verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. In other words, what brought the, the element of the Trinity that God used to bring Christ back to life was the Holy Spirit. What is beautiful about Romans 8 is this reminder. This is Holy Spirit power. The same power that, removed, that brought Christ back to life, the same power that moved the stone away from the tomb, that same power is offered to us in Romans 8. Just listen. It offers hope over the desires you can't control. You ready for this? Have you ever had something in your life you say, I just wish I could stop doing that thing. I, I know it's destructive. I know it hurts other people. I wish I could stop. Just listen to Romans chapter 8, that same Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if through the power of the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. The same Spirit grants you that power. Or how about this? Just listen to this promise. A little later, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. There is confidence in your relationship with God. There is hope over the desires you couldn't control, but there's confidence in your relationship with God. All possible because the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead, and that same power is living in the believer. But perhaps my favorite is found down in verse 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Hope over desires, confidence in your relationship with God, strength in your weakness. The word power <clears throat> in the Greek language is the word um, is the word dunamis. You can hear the word dynamo in that word. You can also hear a similar word to our English words, though the Greek word was written first, obviously, the word dynamite. When I was a child, um, like 10 or 11 or 12 years old, um, we had this reservoir in front of our home. In fact, the reservoir uh, was called the St. Joseph River. There was a dam at the end of that, and they dammed up this small little river that was only about 15 feet across, and it became this huge water reservoir for the town in which I lived, uh, lived outside of in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, it was a great reservoir. It was a great river. It was wide, probably a quarter of a mile across, except when they flooded it like that, all these stumps had been left in the riverbed. They'd rotted there, and they weren't real good for skiing, obviously. It'd either tear up your boat or it'd tear up the skier, okay? And so one year, when they had to do maintenance on that dam, they released all the water out of the river, and it was just mud and stumps. This was back in the, uh, in the probably late 60s, early 70s, and so we didn't have all the regulations we had today. And I remember when Mr. Heller showed up with his big 70s style vehicle with a very big trunk and he opened it up and he began to pass out to those in our community sticks of dynamite, okay? Now just picture this, okay? You're laughing because you're thinking they gave a 12 year old a stick of dynamite? Absolutely, okay? <laughs> and more importantly, the 12 year old was willing to take it and a few more, okay? This is just a simpler time, but we all went out into this riverbed with our dads, okay? We didn't go out there alone, with our dads. And they showed us how to put the cap in the end of the dynamite and how to tuck the fuse in there. And then they said, we're not lighting this one, but light it, so slide it under the stumps and give it a light, right? 
So my dad and I truck out in this muck, <clears throat> find a stump that's about this big around, and we push the dynamite underneath, and we light it, and we run. Okay. And we hide behind this other stump. I, I know none of this is <laughs> its hard to believe. Nothing happens. And my dad says to me, I, I think the fuse went out. Why don't you go check it? Right. <laughs> And I look at him, but I listen to my dad, so I start to get up from behind the stump, and I remember him grabbing me by the back of the neck and saying, I was just kidding, get down, get down. <laughs> and then there was this kaboom, right? And I remember watching a stump that weighs literally hundreds of pounds just propel itself up into the atmosphere. It was like, let's do that again. Let's go get more dynamite, okay? Let's find something else to blow up, okay? All afternoon, from the riverbed. It was just 12-year-old sons blowing up stumps with their dads. Okay? It's like the coolest moment ever. Okay? I've always remembered that story because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, dunamis, Holy Spirit power, is the same power that invites you to trust Christ in a way that all of your urgings all of your struggle with relationships, all of that, you can start to find the peace of God in a relationship with God the Father. This is powerful stuff. It is the power that could move a 4,000-pound stone away like it was nothing. It is the power that could bring a physical body that had been dead for three days back to life as if it had not died. It is the same power that is available to you and to me. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and to me. Wow. Let me close this morning with just a couple of simple thoughts. Maybe you came this morning and you're uh, an agnostic. Maybe you say, maybe it's true, maybe it isn't. Right. Can I remind you of the linen clause? There is enough evidence for you to look and say, I believe, even though you have not seen the, the risen Lord in person. Maybe you're an atheist. Maybe you're saying, I don't believe in God. Why would God allow the bad things to happen in this world? Here's my question for you. A God who let the world run out as the choice of a man and woman, woman in a garden who chose sin over God, not only saw the suffering coming, but embraced the suffering through the cross to win us back. That's a beautiful expression of love. It doesn't make non, non-existent. It gives God depth and meaning and purpose. He isn't a God who's detached from the world. He is a God who loved the world and gave his own son to endure suffering so that we could spend forever with him. Maybe you're saying, Phil, okay, there's some things going on in my life. I need what God offers. Then I would tell you that today isn't by chance. Today isn't simply I get, went this place on Easter. Today is the Spirit of God drawing you. The Word of God says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Not another day, today. Today is the day. If the Spirit of God is working in your heart, I would encourage you to just simply say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I believe you died in the place for my sins, and I'm turning from them. I'm coming to you. You can trust Christ today. If you have more questions about that or that's confusing to you, you can probably turn to the person next to you and ask them to pray with you, and they would love to do that. Hmm. Here's one final thought. Perhaps you came in today as a Christian, with hurt and struggle and difficulty. Can you remember again Mary's story? Years and years of praying so that even while she only had two years with a believing husband, they were years that she said were blessed, precious years and the hope of the resurrection. Wow, all of this available on an Easter Sunday in 2018. We invite you to trust Christ this morning. Will you bow your heads with me? <laughs> if you've never placed your faith in Christ this morning, let me just invite you to do that right now. 
You might want to say, Dear Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I'm coming to you. I am putting my faith in you. Not in my works, not in my ability, not in my talent. I believe in you. Take a moment and thank him for that. If you came to Resurrection Sunday discouraged, fighting fear, wondering about your relationship with God, even though you put your faith in Jesus and are a believer, I just want to remind you, the same spirit of power grants you the ability to call him Abba, Father, term of endearment, Daddy, Father. Your relationship with God is intact for all eternity, not because of something you've done, but because of what Christ did. So just take a moment and thank him for that. Finally, this is a Sunday that we celebrate once a year. Next year when we come back to this Sunday, there will be some who are with us now who won't be with us then. I hope this morning you have heard that the hope of the resurrection is the promise that there is a life after this life. That though we die, yet still we will live. So we give God praise for his resurrected son also promises us a resurrection one day as well. Father, we are thankful to remember, to stand in awe, to sing praises and songs about our sin and our Savior, his ability to forgive. In a world that is so full of death, Lord, we are privileged to sing songs about life, a life that is beyond this life. And so we give you praise for that today. May we lift our voices and may we live differently this day and this week as a result of the resurrection of your son for whom we praise you and we ask these things in his name.